And now I, I am very much looking forward to listening and hearing Chris Borg and what she, the once and future librarian. And as I said, please read the back of the program for biographical details. Okay, good morning, and thank you all for being here, and Colleen, thank you for inviting me. Uh, it's great to be here to be talking about such an important topic which, with such a great group of people and s some colleagues that I've long admired and, and enjoy working with and, and love to listen to. It's already been a great conversation. So, so I have to be honest, though, um, this is actually not super good timing for me. So. Uh, Earlier this week, we buried my brother-in-law. So Alfredo, Freddy Cordero Jr. He was a great guy, sweet, kind soul. His life was both harder and shorter than it should have been. I wondered whether I should share something that personal in a talk like this. Um, but I'm an old, fem I'm a longtime feminist. And I, I do believe that the personal is political, is professional, and back again. So, uh, so that's where my head's at. And, uh, this weekend, while I was writing this talk, my wife was writing a eulogy for her brother. And that felt like a really weird and, and frankly uncomfortable juxtaposition. Uh, and then I realized the extent to which grief and grieving serve to crystallize just how important and precious the past is and how fragile and uncertain the future. And that seemed like a pretty good set of perspectives to carry into a talk about the future of, of research libraries. And if you'll indulge me one more connection, Freddie grew up in Bridgeport, Connecticut. Bridgeport is one of the largest cities in Connecticut. It's also one of the poorest. But the Bridgeport Public Library plays a really vital role in the life of the residents of Bridgeport. Its motto is a gathering place for the entire community. And its mission statement includes the assertion that we believe that libraries can change people's lives and are a cornerstone of our democracy. Well, I think all libraries, public and research libraries, can and should aim for the same kind of impact, to be an inclusive gathering place, to change lives, and to advance democracy. In the case of academic libraries, we are and should always be a safe, multidisciplinary, information-rich gathering place for members of our communities. We do and should always aspire to have transformative impact on students, of course, but I think also on faculty by providing expertise, tools, resources, and services that inspire new kinds of research questions and that serve as catalysts for experiments in new forms of pedagogy. And we do and should always take seriously our role in producing informed citizens who can participate in their own governance through the democratic process. <clears throat> so anyway, there are plenty of ways to talk about uh, the future of libraries and plenty of questions within that topic that we could tackle. So what will the right mix of print and digital resources be in five years, in 10 years? And by the way, the only right answers to those questions are, I don't know, and it depends. What should a physical library look like as more and more resources are available in digital rather than physical format? What's the next big technological breakthrough that will transform how people discover and access information? These are all great questions that highlight important ways to talk about the future of libraries. And I'm really glad that my colleagues on the panel are going to address them. Because the topic I want to talk about is what kinds of expertise will be needed in the great research libraries of the future. And I want to suggest that the expertise that will ensure that the future academic library continues to be a central part of the research and teaching life of a university is similar to the expertise that librarians already bring to the table. We just might need more of it. All right, so here's where I take a short and I think slightly dangerous detour to define what I mean by librarian. So it's tempting to stop here. 
and use this uh, definition from Urban Dictionary. Um, I kind of like this. I might put that on a business card. <laughs> but what I really want to talk about is the human capital that is inherent in library organizations. The distinct expertise, the skills, the perspectives, the values that people who work in libraries contribute to the academy. And I use the term librarian, and maybe we can use it with a lowercase l instead of the capital L, official librarian, but I use the term to describe all of those people, the people who work in the library organization and who contribute to the core missions of the library. Now, that's controversial, especially here, I suppose, in Canada, I mean, not here at McGill specifically. Uh, but to refer to the broad range of people who work in libraries as librarians, regardless of their job title or credentials, is, is pretty controversial. So let me be clear. I use the term in this more inclusive way not to devalue the library degree or those who hold it in any way. I use it rather to value the range of degrees, skills, talents, expertise, experience that are needed to make information accessible to current and future scholars. And I do this because I choose to believe that professional respect is not a limited resource and I believe a more expansive understanding of who a librarian is and what academic librarians do to advance research and teaching is critical to a robust future for libraries and for higher education. All right, back to this idea. I'll, I'll step off that dangerous path and get back to the central core of my talk. So my bottom line is that the, the future of libraries depends on librarians, straight up. We need a diverse, highly skilled, values-driven set of people who will collaborate across and within institutions to support, to create, and to inspire the very best of current and future scholarship and teaching. And those people do it from a distinct and important perspective. And the best way I can think of to describe that perspective is to talk sort of a little bit about my own journey into librarianship, to sort of highlight the ways that I had to learn to think differently as a librarian. Ways of thinking that I think make librarians key to not just collecting, preserving, and providing access to scholarship, but to producing and shaping it as well. So I moved to Stanford, uh, so, so as if you read my bio and, and Colleen alluded to it, I, I just started this job at MIT uh, a little over a month ago. I've been at Stanford for almost 20 years. I moved there in the, uh, in the early 90s uh, after spending three years on the faculty at West Point, the US Military Academy at West Point, where I taught leadership and sociology to the cadets there. Um, and, and I moved out to Stanford to pursue a PhD in sociology with sort of the vague intention of pursuing a regular faculty position when I finished. But some of you may know Stanford and Palo Alto are rather expensive places to live, so I immediately got myself a part-time job in the libraries. And I worked in the libraries uh, throughout my graduate career. By the time I finished my PhD, I was recruited into a full-time position in the libraries as a social sciences librarian. And for me, that sort of career turn made a lot of sense. By that time, I had realized that I could have a greater impact on scholarship and on the future of higher education and scholarly communication through a career in libraries than I could have had as an individual scholar. And as I made that tradition, that transition from sort of preparing for a career as an individual scholar to a career in librarianship, I found that being an academic librarian required a significant change in perspective. So in the most general sense, I would say that the librarians I've worked with operate at a different level of analysis than do most individual faculty members. So for example, as a PhD student, you're expected to become an expert in the discipline with a solid grasp of the seminal works and the main journals in your field. As a librarian, I found I needed to think in much more multidisciplinary ways. And as I built and maintained collections in several disciplines, I couldn't afford to select for, for individual authors. I had to learn the publishing landscape for each discipline so I would know what publishers were strong in which fields, who published quality journals at reasonable prices, and who published monographs in fields that were most active at my university. I also learned how important metadata is to just about everything librarians do. 
And I started thinking less about specific books and articles and more about the scholarly communication system as a whole and how it, was, how, how, it, how it was changing and how it needed to change to support new modes of scholarship and to allow for open access to the scholarly record. And I had to start taking a much longer view of both the past and of the future. For me, it's this distinctive set of perspectives that means librarians have been working on and thinking about issues like open access, metadata, data privacy, digital preservation, and many more important topics for frankly much longer than most, most others in the academy. And certainly for longer and with more rigor than most outside the academy. So this was uh, never more evident uh, than uh, about a month ago when Google Vice President Vint Cerf made big news by talking about how worried he is that the digital documents and images we're all creating will disappear as software and hardware becomes obsolete. Now, this, this was big news. Vint Cerf was talking about the digital dark ages and he was expressing this grave concern. When that news sort of, um, of Cerf's fear reached the library community, our, our collective reaction was best summarized, I think, um, by Dorothea Salo, one of, uh, she's to me one of librarians most insightful and important um, voices. She's a faculty member at the Information School at the University of Wisconsin. So, I mean, she took to Twitter to explain, like, it's okay, Vin, we've, we've got this. We've been worrying about this for a long time. We've been thinking about digital pr preservation for a long time now. You don't need to worry about it. We've already built digital repositories. We've established workflows. We've established access systems for, for digital uh, artifacts. We teach digital, personal digital archiving classes. We create standards. We've built the capacity to not just store and back up, but to truly archive for the long term the digital artifacts of our culture and of our scholarship. That's our job. And it's the kind of thinking and work that is a distinct strength of librarians. We think about the long-term future of the past so that scholars and students can use it in the present. At many universities, libraries and librarians have been supporting digital humanities research, computational social science research, GIS work, data visualization, technology-enhanced pedagogy, and sound data management practices for a very long time. Today's librarians have expertise, skills, and perspectives that are absolutely critical to the changing research and teaching needs of today's faculty and students. And I think any vision for the future of research libraries needs to include ways to highlight and maximize the contributions of library experts to research and teaching. So since it's free, I'm gonna offer some advice. One of the major challenges for most academic libraries I know is a lack of awareness among faculty and students that the library, of, of all that the libraries and librarians have to offer. So every library survey I've seen from multiple institutions shows that you know, it's, it's, almost, it's, it's startling how consistent it is. It's somewhere between 80 and 90% of all faculty and students at any institution you survey are very satisfied with their library. And that's great news. If you look beneath the surface, those, those libraries that, that delve into this, plus there's plenty of anecdotal uh, evidence, the evidence also reveals that high percentage of faculty and students are likewise unaware of the full range of services and expertise their libraries and librarians have to offer. And that's a big challenge. So my first bit of advice is that you should ensure that your vision for the future of research and academic libraries prominently features librarians, both metaphorically and literally. You need to design spaces and services that showcase the full range of expertise that librarians bring to the academy and bring to research and teaching. And no, I don't mean simply ensure that the reference desk is visible from the entrance to the library. If you want a truly great library, and it's clear that you do, that you have one and you want to maintain that, you have to design spaces that emphasize that librarians have expertise in a huge range of areas vital to scholarship and teaching. 
from data and metadata to digital preservation to publishing to online learning, software development, text mining, project management, and yes, even reference. You have to ensure that your library is designed to make those experts visible and accessible to scholars and students. And as Larry showed, you need to include in your designs plenty of information and technology-rich environments for faculty and students to collaborate, not just with each other, but with those library experts. So my second bit of advice is that you recognize that the best future we can imagine for higher education and for libraries is likely to come from a more diverse and inclusive conversation than the ones we usually have. And I'm a sociologist by training, so of course I mean diverse along the usual axes of diversity that we talk about, race, class, gender, sexuality, some that we sometimes forget, uh, neurodiversity, uh, and including people with different physical abilities and disabilities. I also think that when we're having these local conversations about the future of our own academic institutions and our own libraries, we need to be very deliberate about including as many voices as possible. So for example, if we really want to understand how students use library spaces and what's missing from library spaces that students find frustrating, I think we would do well to talk to the library support staff who work the late evening shifts. If we want to understand how our print collections really get used, and here I'm talking about the full range of use, not just sort of what gets officially checked out, we need to talk to the staff who reshelve the books and keep the stacks maintained and in order. But of course, my whole point is that the future of libraries is about much more than finding the right balance between print and digital or designing the right kinds of study and collaborative spaces for students. Those are important parts of it. But I would challenge you to imagine a future library where every scholar and every student has the maximum opportunity to work with experts in the library who bring unique skills and knowledge and perspectives that could jumpstart new research and can transform learning. So I started out by saying the future is, is fragile and uncertain and, and, and I would emphasize that it's very, very hard to predict. But the one thing that I am certain about about the future is that the best future we can plan for will be one that we uh, design through collaboration with, again, a very diverse set of, vo of voices. Thanks very much, I'm happy to take some questions. I invite people to come to the microphone. I was, in, I was quite enchanted with uh, Chris's remarks and I hope that we have some questions. Hi, Chris. Um, thank you very much for your talk. I'm Lori Clota. I'm a librarian here at McGill. Um, my question is kind of general. Um, I'm really intrigued and I'm pleased to see that, to hear that you're talking about um, librarians and all staff in the library and not just collections and facilities. I think that's sort of the trinity of libraries is that you need people as well. Um, but I guess I'm wondering, in terms of the future, if you're seeing um, just librarians with similar skills or, you know, we're working on the same things, or are you seeing sort of a, a change in the professionalism and the, the expertise or scholarship that people could bring, people that work in the library should have or could bring to their jobs or their roles in the library? So if I understand the question, am I seeing, am I seeing a trend towards new sets of skills that we need in the folks who work in libraries? Not, yeah, not just skills, but even new kinds of people, new kinds of experts, new kinds of broader than skills, I'm trying to be broader than that, I guess. You know, I, I, I mean, uh, so if you read any of my work, you'll see that I'm a big fan of diversity of all kinds, and I think that there's plenty of sociological research that shows that diversity of many kinds makes for stronger uh, organizations and better decisions and better work products and so forth. So, of course, I think that um, the best future for any organization is to diversify the, uh, the, the workforce in many, many dimensions, right? And that would be skills and, and perspectives and, um, education and talents and 
experience. So uh, yes, I think that's important. I'm not sure that answers your question. Um, it's a hard question to, to answer without getting into specifics and, and diving deeper in, down that dangerous path. Um, so I came from Stanford, uh, and the library there um, has very, I think, fairly untraditional hiring practices. Um, for example, you know, they hired me right out of the PhD program with no library background other than, than having worked as a graduate student in the social science data service. Um, they seem to like me, they, you know, and that's a fairly common practice at Stanford to hire PhDs and if they have the library degree, great. If not, um, there's a, a trust that, that those kinds of skills, and they are important, let me be clear, I do think that there is something very important and very specific about being a librarian and developing a set of skills and values and perspectives. Um, at Stanford, there's a, a trust that, that that can be taught on the job. And, and for many folks, that turned out to be the case. Um, but there's, I, I mean, there's definitely, we need folks who can, um, you know, who are comfortable in the digital realm, who understand digital scholarship. You know, if, uh, if you're gonna be supporting, uh, at, you know, for example, and, and again, I've only been at MIT for a month, so I'm sorry that my examples are all Stanford still. Um, but you know, at, at Stanford, when we hire humanities librarians, they have to understand digital humanities because that's huge at Stanford. That, you know, what, I don't know if that's the case, uh, you know, at other, you know, other universities, that skill set needs to be specific to sort of what's going on and what the, the sort of research and teaching trends at that university are. At MIT, I very much uh, need and have librarians who, who understand online learning. You know, MIT X, MIT's a huge, uh, uh, doing a big push with edX and with online learning and digital learning. And the, the library needs to be right in the middle of that. And I'm lucky to have staff that understand that and have those skill sets and a desire to learn that. Um, Thanks. I hope that answers the yes, question. Thanks. Uh, Louis Will from McGill. Uh, as you alluded at the beginning of your uh, talk, definition of a librarian en encompassing other than just librarian, I just want to add to what you just said. In the, uh, where do you see the profession as a librarian going? Meaning that, as, uh, as you know, at many associations, local, regional, or national, who are defending, pushing the librarian as a profession and meaning to have a library degree in, in order to work as a librarian or be head of a library or a dean or whatever. There's a big, big push about that and also as well push back against when uh, probably the same, your place also as well, saying that whenever you have a big head been hired and with no library degree, it's a big kerfuffle. I mean, in the, I mean, it makes a lot of noise, of course. And knowing that, you're talking about the expertise, new expertise we have to have librarians going forward. And you know there's a disconnection also as well between the profession and the library school themselves also as well. How to bring that going forward, and this is why probably also as well, we need non-library degree people more and more in our environment to work that up because there's a big disconnection also as well still. Um, I'm probably not the most qualified to answer that question, you know, having, not having a library degree and not having spent time in uh, an information school or a library school. Uh, there are plenty of folks who are doing that work, um, who are transforming the curriculum in library schools to try and meet the, the current needs of, of uh, libraries. Um, what I will say is I, I, I do think that uh, librarians and research libraries ought to have an advanced degree of some kind. I think that understanding how to do uh, original research and, and doing study at that level um, is important to supporting faculty and students who are doing work at that level. Um, I wonder, and I don't know the answer to this, but I do wonder whether uh, a degree that is designed to prepare people for a range of librarianship from public libraries to <coughs> hardcore research libraries like McGill and MIT and Stanford to school libraries to special libraries, whether one degree and one kind of degree program is the right preparation. 
Um, I'd love for librarianship to, to be able to sort of step back and have that honest conversation about what are the skills and perspectives and values and ways of thinking that are valuable in different kinds of, of library settings and how can we prepare people for those careers? If I can add just, just quickly, interesting of course, but yet at the same time, I'm not just defending the library as a professional, okay? It's not my, my goal. And I'm just saying because I see in, if we set aside, step outside of the box academic libraries, for instance, public libraries, school library, elementary libraries, high school, it's very difficult. People have been pushing, need to have libraries there. It's important for the kids, everything. And at the same time, pushing the professional library, library technicians or librarians also as well to be there, to be hired. And yet, it's very difficult for many places to make that case also as well. Why should we hire you or not? And what's the difference, anything also mm -hmm. as well? So that, in, in those environments, it's very different, of course, than more in our environment here. But. No, I hear you, and, and I, would, I, I think um, librarianship has a PR problem. I'm, I'm going to take the last question. Um, <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh dear. This is one of our wonderful students. Oh, thank oh. you. <laughs> uh, hi, I'm Cloister Canigan. I'm the Vice President of University Affairs over at the Student Society. Oh, cool. So uh, Thanks I for heard, being here. Thanks. <laughs> Glad to be here. Um, so I heard you talking about, um, you were speaking about uh, the importance of incorporating uh, principles of equity into uh, into thinking about what our libraries uh, can be. And that was, uh, that's very exciting for, for us to hear. But uh, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more to some of the, uh, what are some of the best practices of the most, some of the most exciting prospects in making library spaces accessible to uh, a wider diversity of people along the various axes that you spoke about? Oh, wow, that's such a great question. That's a whole nother talk. Um, <laughs> but what a great question. Um, I think there, you know, I mean, there are a number of, of tactics. Um, the first one is the hardest. Um, librarianship is um, pathetically homogenous. I'm sorry. It just is. We're, in the U.S. at least, we're 80% um, female and 88% white. Right. So the first step is we, we need to have a more diverse profession. Um, we absolutely do need to do that. And, and we've got to, um, there are a number of great programs that are working on what people call the pipeline issue um, in getting uh, uh, people from underrepresented minorities into library schools and into, into jobs. Um, but they're a drop in the bucket. And we need to do, we need to do a serious push um, to diversify the profession. Um, I also think that we need to diversify our collections. Um, you know, most of the, the big, and, and again, I speak from the U.S. perspective mostly, but most of the big research collections, we collect what's important, and that was, um, you know, that was not de determined in the past, and we still struggle to determine that in an equitable way um, and without bias. I'm a sociologist. I'm well aware that, that bias creeps into every decision that we make, whether we intend to or not. And so we have to make conscious efforts um, to avoid that and to recognize that and to diversify our collections and our staff. And then in terms of services, we need to actually be out in the communities and finding out what the real needs are um, and making our spaces accessible and and, uh, and inviting, and, and I really do believe we need to, librarians and libraries need to sort of cling to those core values. Um, uh, the American Library Association um, claims diversity as a core value and that we, sell, we, we strive to reflect the diversity um, of our communities. Um, I sometimes uh, quip that if we're striving, we're not doing a very good job of it. Um, <laughs> But uh, you know, I think that we need to do that in a range of ways. Um, one of the, the best examples I've seen of ways that, that libraries sort of have stepped up and said, we're the place where everyone can feel comfortable talking about difficult issues, um, no matter what perspective you're coming from and no matter where you are so in terms of a social setting, um, was the librarians who rallied around, and especially at the um, Washington University in, C in St. Louis, um, who developed collections and um, research guides right after the Ferguson riots and right in the middle of it, and also the Ferguson Public Library that remained open throughout those months as a safe gathering place for the, for the community. 
Um, and so there are, there are libraries that are stepping up and sort of recognizing that, that we are this sort of ec ecumenical, diverse, we can be that gathering place, um, but we have to do it consciously and, and intentionally. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. I'm not going to best that question, so I'm not even going to try. <laughs> um, so uh, we have a short break, and we will reconvene at 1030. Thank you all. <laughs>